How many of you guys have ever named something before? A pet, a child. It's important to name something the right thing. How many of you are really upset at your parents for what they named you? Anybody in the room? <laughs> I see one hand sort of in the back. Uh, but you're like, I really preferred you. Like what we name something is super important. What we name our kids is important. What we name the relationships in our life is super important, isn't it? Like it's so, so important to accurately label the relationships in our life. If you're in here today and you're, you're sitting next to somebody, who that person is to you is significant. If you're in here and you're sitting next to your spouse, it's important that that is labeled, this person is my husband, this person is my wife. Because if that person is not appropriately labeled, other people and you yourself will approach them differently depending on who they are to you. It's really, really important. When we look at people, we understand the relationships that people have based off the label that they put on that relationship. How many of you uh, parents in the room, you, you ever look at, or maybe even the older generation, you look at some of the younger generation and the way they talk about like their boyfriend or their girlfriend and you're like, y'all need to slow down, okay? Y'all need to pump the brakes just a minute. You know, you see a 14-year-old talking about like hubby and wifey, I'm like, oh no, sir, your frontal lobe is not developed yet, you know? Like you need to just chill, slow your roll. You are mislabeling the relationship. That is your boyfriend in junior high for about 37 days. That is not hubby, okay? You are mislabeling it. And then how you approach that relationship as a teenager is vastly different because you have labeled it something that it's not. That's why it's important for us to label things appropriately. It, it affects how we approach something, and it affects how other people see it. It affects how other people see our relationship. If you're in here tonight, and if you're a woman and you're married, and your husband was in a room full of women, and they said, who is she to you? And he's like, oh, that's my friend. We have a problem. We have a problem. And other people are going to approach you differently based off of how we label things. It's important to label things appropriately because it not only affects how we see it, but how other people see it as well. With that being said, there's this really interesting verse in the Bible that's kind of tucked away at the back of a much longer paragraph, and it's a sentence that has always stood out to me, and I want us to dive into that sentence tonight. It's found in the book of Acts. If you guys have your Bibles, you can open them to the book of Acts. It's in the New Testament right after the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. We're going to open it up to chapter 11. It says this in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, it says, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. There's something fascinating that happens right here, and it's so easy for us to miss it. Again, because I said it was sandwiched in a paragraph. There's so much other information going on at this point. The gospel is breaking out across the world. It's left the Jewish people, and it's now gone to the Gentiles, and a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are taking place. The church is exploding. The church is thriving. God is moving. Miracles are happening. Lives are being changed, and then there's this little sentence tucked away in there. It says, the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. What that means is all the way up until this point, they were not known as Christians. All the way up until this point, they were known by a different name. And then at this point, they get labeled, somebody say labeled, Christians. Now, we live in a, a, a culture where like that's the only label that we know. As modern believers, like the only label that we know is that of Christians. But in the New Testament, that was not a label that they used until they first are called Christians at Antioch. They used labels such as the brethren. You can see that in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 20. They use the term the saints in Acts chapter 19, verses 13, 2 Corinthians 13, 13. Um, in fact, we see Saul, when he is going to persecute the believers... He is looking for those who belong to the way. That's Acts chapter 9, verses 2. He's walking around. He's not like, hey, where are the Christians at? He said, where are the followers of the way? 
An early label for Christians could have possibly been people of the way, followers of the way. This is what Christians were known as at the time. And then in Antioch, for the very first time, they're called disciples. Why? In our modern culture, in our modern context, somebody calling us a Christian is a good thing. In this time, when they call them a Christian, the historical tendency was to use nicknames as a form of satire. So it was a form of mocking. So if there was a political movement and there was a general named General Pompey, they would say, oh, you are Pompeians. If you were following uh, Augustus Caesar, they would say you are Augustans. And they would do that as a way of just grouping you with the person that you were following, and it was a way of belittling you, and people from opposing sides would use that nickname in a derogatory fashion to just say, oh, you're just little Christs. You're just a bunch of little imitators of Jesus running around. You're just followers of this guy. And they took it away from what they were labeling themselves, and they put it as something that we see as an insult. And at its core, it is a form of reduction, where we use language to try to reduce somebody else's perspective to something that is not accurate reflection of what they believe or who they are. We see it in modern American politics all the time. Have you guys noticed, I don't care what side of a political spectrum you are, Every side labels the other side something that is just completely inaccurate 90% of the time. Isn't that right? If you're talking about somebody on the right, they're like, oh, this person is far right. If you're talking about somebody on the left, like, oh, this person is far left. This person is a Nazi. This person is a communist. This person is literally Hitler. No, they're not. That is a label that you're applying on somebody so that you can reduce who they are and what they stand for to a caricature of who they are and what they stand for. And now we're not interacting with it on the basis of what it should be. We're interacting it on the basis of this picture that you have painted that is a reduction of what it should be. So it's super important for us to understand this. I'm going to make a point that I think is super valuable for us to grab onto, is what they did is they reduced who the believers of Jesus Christ were, the followers of the way, to the term that at the time was derogatory Christians. Now, here's the thing. If we think about it linguistically, when I say I am a follower of the way, what is that communicating to everybody that the way that I follow is the only one. That every other way is an artificial way. That every other way is a counterfeit way because I am a follower of the way. I'm communicating to everybody that I'm going in a particular direction and you need to get along with me to go in the right direction. And so what they did at the time is they said, no, we, we don't want to have a conversation about you being a follower of the way. We hate the word the way. We want to reduce you down to just little imitators of Jesus. How do we reduce it down? I think this is so important because I think that this is a concept that is subconscious in American Christianity. Now, I'm not here to say that we shouldn't call ourselves Christian. That is now the name that we have adopted for ourselves. We should call ourselves Christian. We should be proud about it. In fact, the Apostle Paul told people in the New Testament, don't be ashamed when people call you Christians. Like, don't try to hide it. Don't, don't try to take that thing that is intended as an insult and allow it to be something that causes you to pull back and live small. So it is a good thing if somebody calls us a Christian, we should fly that banner high and be excited and be proud about it. But the point that I'm trying to make is how we label our faith affects how we approach our faith. And I believe that for many of us in modern American Christianity, we have taken on a reductionist perspective of what it means to be followers of the way of Jesus Christ. We've reduced it down. We've distilled it down. We've allowed a little bit of the insults of culture to seep its way into our faith and allowed us to pour a little bit of water into who we are as believers. There was a famous theologian that said modern Christianity has been distilled to the point that if it were a poison, nobody would die from it. And if it were a medicine, nobody would benefit from it. We've distilled down what it means to be a follower of Jesus to a point where it's not 
as effective as it could be or possibly should be. So I want to look at two labels tonight, and I want you to ask yourself a question. By the end of this message, how do I want to label my faith in Jesus Christ? How do I want to label my faith and my relationship with my king and with my God? The first label is the label of a Christian. Listen, the definition of a Christian is a person who has received Christian baptism or is a believer in Jesus Christ and his teachings. How many people in here are like, that? Qual I qualify for that? I've been baptized. I believe in Jesus and his teaching. I believe Jesus is the son of God. If that's you, if you believe Jesus is the son of God, you believe in the Bible, that it is the word of God, lift your hand up and be like, I'm a Christian. So, so many of us, we fit that description as a believer. I believe in Jesus. That's, that's basic. I believe in Jesus. Bam. I am a Christian. It was something that was intended as an insult, but by default, if I believe in Jesus, if I say I'm a Christian, everybody knows what I'm talking about. How many of you guys know, though, that we live in what is called a Christian country? You guys know that the majority of people in the United States, in terms of a faith that they would subscribe to or identify with, the majority of people in the United States would say that they would be Christians. How many of you guys know that almost every single president we have ever had, if not all of them to my memory, have said that they are Christians? How many of you guys would agree that not every single president that we've ever had acts like a Christian or is legitimately one? So it is a label. Oh, I believe in Jesus, therefore I'm a Christian. I claim that label. So that is a label that we all get by default if we believe in Jesus. We are all Christians. There's another label I want us to look at which is the most common label that was used to describe believers in the Bible. All throughout Scripture, this is the dominant label that was applied to people that believed in Christ. It was the label of disciple. Somebody say disciple. Yeah. Now, the definition of a disciple is a follower and student of a teacher or leader. Now, here's the thing. The first label, all it requires me to do is believe. The second label requires me to now follow and learn. There's a greater requirement with the second label. If you dig deeper into the definition of disciple, it is to guide someone into being a follower of Jesus or another leader. If you look at synonym, synonyms of disciple, it is a follower, a pupil, a learner, or an apprentice. I love that word apprentice. What does an apprentice mean? We have lost apprenticeships in our modern culture. How many of you guys ever went through an apprenticeship? Can I see some hands? Not a lot, okay, just a few. You went through an apprenticeship. What did you go through an apprenticeship for? Plumbing, plumbing. okay. So what did you do to be a plumber's apprentice? <laughs> you followed the guy around and learned how to do it. So if he told you this is how we do it, you listened. You paid attention. When he started working with the tools, you would observe how he used those tools and then you would adopt his method and his approach to the practice. That's what it means to be an apprentice. And throughout human history, all the way up until the modern age, the way you learned a trade was to apprentice underneath somebody. Now we have universities, now we have YouTube University. Like, I can Google how to fix my sink faster than I can call him to get over to take care of it. Are you with me? But, for all of human history, the way that we learned before university, we would apprentice, under, if I wanted to be a blacksmith, I didn't go to blacksmith college or watch YouTube, I went and apprenticed under a blacksmith, and I would live with him for years and watch how he worked. This is what it means, listen, to be a disciple. It's to be an apprentice. Are you with me? And I, I live in a modern age where I can just go to YouTube and get my answers, but no, being a disciple is more hands-on than that. I can't go to YouTube and watch a video on how to preach and preach a sermon. I actually need to be submitted to something and be discipled and go through a process that requires years of investment, that requires years of effort, that requires tons of dedication and devotion and consistency. This is what is required of me if I want to be an apprentice. And listen to me, this is what's required of you if you want to be a disciple. Like the standard is higher for a disciple than it is for a Christian. Are you with me? The standard, like all that's required of me to be a Christian is to just believe. Guess what? I believe. We sang the song, too good not to believe. And I do believe. 
He's too good to not believe, so I believe. I'm a Christian. Okay, are you ready to be a disciple? Are you ready to be an apprentice? Are you ready to submit yourself to a process and spend the rest of your life perfecting that process to reach a degree of mastery to where you can now apprentice other people and disciple other people to be followers of the way? Are you listening to me tonight, church? Is this good? Are you guys learning something from it? And I think as Christians, we settle so often. We get so excited about achieving the bare minimum. And I want to lean into this for just a moment, church, because I think as Christians, like, we, we live in a participation trophy generation as believers. Where, we're, like, we get so excited because we showed up. You know? We get so excited because we've shown up. Now, how many of you guys, as, how many parents in the room, you have young children? Uh, how many, you, 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 bro, you find yourself, like, really excited when your daughter brings you up, like, the ugliest drawing known to man, right? It's like a stick figure that she did with crowns, you know what I mean? It looked like she did it while she was in the dryer spinning, you know, like, it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing! Because how old is she, how old is your daughter? Five, this is awesome! I'm not looking for the Mona Lisa, this is incredible, you're five years old and you did this? But listen, if your daughter comes up to you and she's 45, and she brings the same drawing, dad, look what I did, you're like, baby girl, you were not created to be an artist. I love you. You're really good at math, you know, like, you know, you're, 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 good, at, you're good at this. You're good at cooking. Don't pick up a pencil anymore. I need you to progress. I need you to push yourself and challenge yourself to not get excited about doing the bare minimum. And here's the thing. We are a lot more critical of the world than we are of ourselves. Are you with me? We're a lot more critical of the world than we are of ourselves. The, the Olympic Games are, are an example of it. Like, if you watch the Olympics, like, I feel like there's something that is a controversy that Christians are freaking, about, freaking out about every single day when it comes to the Olympics. And it's like, okay, like, the world is the world. Like, this is my perspective. Like, you're surprised that the world is doing the world things. And you're just like, oh, non-believers don't share my values. Did they ever? Why are you so offended when in the church we aren't being all that we could be or should be? And I believe the greatest testimony to an unbelieving world is not the outrage of the church, but it is disciples of Christ who pick up the cross of Jesus and show an unbelieving world what it means to experience a relationship with a Savior. Your outrage isn't changing anything, but your testimony can if you will put that on display instead of your political perspective. If self-righteousness were an Olympic sport, I'm certain that Christians would win the gold medal. We would. If getting offended was an Olympic sport, like, we would at least take silver. We're really, really good at that. But you know what we're not good at? Actually being a movement of men and women that are so passionate and so possessed by a relationship with Jesus Christ that we are willing to take that to everybody that we know. What if we turn just a little bit of our outward perspective inward and started looking at ourselves and our relationship with God and our own personal devotion and said, you know what's more offensive to God than what somebody did at the opening ceremony of the Olympics is how little I actually pray. It's how little I actually open up the Bible. What do you think God is more of it? You think God is up in heaven, up in heaven looking at a, a, a world full of unbelievers that are gathering together to celebrate the pinnacle of humanity? And they celebrate it in a way that is contrary to his perspective? You think God's up in heaven looking at that and be like, oh, man, I really wish they wouldn't have done Or do you think God is looking at you, man or woman of God, who will refuse to teach your children how to pray, how to read the word? What do you think is more offensive to the father do you think that he wants you to settle for being a christian or you think he is calling you out of the bare minimum to become a disciple throughout the whole bible the word disciple appears 260 times and christian only appears three which one do you think is a more significant label to be applied to followers of christ 
on the three times that the word Christian is used, it's never used by choice. It's never the church calling themselves Christian. It's always other people calling them Christians or them saying, don't be offended that they're calling you Christians. When they refer to themselves, they say, we are disciples. Listen, after accepting Christ, we are Christians by default, but we are disciples by choice. If you come in here tonight and you feel God's presence moving on you and you decide, I want to be a believer, I want to be a believer in Jesus, you are a Christian by default. You accepted Jesus, you're a Christian. But listen, you have to make a decision to be a disciple. That you know what, it's not just going to be me praying a prayer. It's not just going to be me showing up. It's not just going to be me doing the bare minimum. I am making a conscious decision that every day of my life is going to be obsessed with being an apprentice where I sit at the feet of Jesus and I learn and I receive and I grow and I develop as a man or a woman. We see in scripture that disciples are both men and women, which is a radical idea in Jesus's time. In Jesus's time, women were not allowed to be educated in Jesus's time. Like, that's so wild to us today, right? Like, it's such a foreign concept. But in Jesus' time, it was not normal for a woman to receive an education. And here we see women sitting at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus is teaching them because Jesus is saying that being a disciple is for everybody. It's for everybody. It's for the young and the old, the male and the female, the rich and the poor. Every cultural and dividing line is disintegrated when we come into Christianity, when we come into this faith. Everything that divides you out in the world unites us together in Christ. The only distinction for us as believers is devotion. Devotion is our only distinction. That's the only thing, listen, that completely sets us apart is how devoted are we? Not are we male or female? Not are we black or white? Not are we rich or poor? Like none of those things matter. What matters is are you devoted or not? Because your devotion determines whether or not you're a disciple. You know, this past week I was at a conference and there's a, there's a, a preacher named Manny Orango. If you guys have never heard him preach, you can look up some of his sermons, phenomenal. But he started a program called ARMA, which is like an online biblical uh, online Bible school, essentially. They do biblical lectures. He's a doctor of theology, and he teaches biblical lectures. And I asked him what caused him to create this program. And he said, I was a youth pastor during COVID, and I had pastored a lot of these kids all the way through middle school and high school, and then COVID happened, a lot of the political unrest and the stuff that came from that. And he's like, and I watched kids that I had spent years turning into Christians turn on a dime and leave the faith. And I realized I need to stop making more Christians and start making more disciples. And this concept was born from that. I was listening to that conversation with him and thinking about how important it is for us to become true disciples of Jesus. Because when we're Christians, listen, if driving an extra 20 minutes to go to church on a Sunday night, if you're just a Christian, that now becomes a chore. That now becomes a burden. That now becomes an obligation. But listen, if I'm a disciple of Jesus, if I'm an apprentice of Jesus, then wherever he goes, I go. Whenever he moves, I move. Whatever he says, I do. And if I have an opportunity to come and to learn something, I treat that with a high degree of respect and reverence because I wouldn't be anywhere if not for Jesus. And I need to grow as much as I can, and I need to contribute as much as I can, and I need to participate as much as I can, because I'm not just a Christian, I am a disciple. So what are the, what are the, what are the characteristics of a disciple? What makes a disciple different than a Christian? We're going to look at three things tonight before I close. Are you guys ready? Number one is a disciple is devoted. Somebody say that with me tonight. A disciple is devoted. A disciple is devoted. Not all Christians are devoted. Have you guys noticed that? You know what the statistic is for Christians? The average Christian goes to church once every six weeks. Before COVID, it was once every three weeks. The average Christian goes to church once every three weeks. Or sorry, once every six weeks now. Is that devotion? A disciple is devoted. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 27, it says this, a large crowd was following Jesus. Somebody say large crowd. A large crowd was following Jesus. Doesn't it feel good to go to church and find a large crowd? 
Amen? How many guys you were at our launch Sunday service? Anybody? There's 700 people there. I was crazy. That was a large crowd. That was a large crowd. It feels good to be in church and all the chairs are full. It feels good to be in church and everything's hustling and bustling. A large crowd was following Jesus and he turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciples, you must hate everybody else by comparison. Oh, there's nothing that's going to shrink a crowd faster than telling them that you've got to hate everything else in your life by comparison and pursue what I'm calling you to pursue. He says, your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, sisters, yes, even your own life. Now, he's not telling you to literally hate your kids, okay? He's saying, in comparison, like, you need to love me and value me so much that if you hold the two together, they're not even close. He says, otherwise, somebody say otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. What? Jesus, I already thought I was one of your disciples. I showed up to church. I came here. I sat in the chair. I'm one of your disciples. And he said, nope, unless you are willing to completely elevate me above everything else, you can't be my disciple. And there's a large crowd there. What he is telling, it says there's a large crowd and he turns around. You know what that implies to me? That implies that he saw a bunch of posers in the crowd. Are you with me? There's a, there's a large crowd and he turned around. Wait a minute. I need to weed this crowd down a little bit. I got to find out who the real ones are. I have to determine who the Christians are and who the disciples are. I need to separate the wheat from the chaff. I need to separate the sheep from the goats. We need to have a conversation about how serious you are about this thing that you say is the most important thing for you. A large crowd of Christians follow Jesus. But not all of them were willing to carry their cross. Not all of them were willing to be disciples. And I have a question for you tonight. Are you a part of the crowd or are you part of the core? Are you a part of the crowd or the core? Because there's so many times in the Bible where Jesus speaks to a crowd and then the next day they're gone. And then he's left with his core. He's left with the disciples. He's left with the 12. There's times where it says Jesus fed 5,000 men. Oh, but there's also women and children there. Theologians believe there was 25,000 people. Jesus is filling up Minute Maid Stadium. He's preaching in Minute Maid Stadium. He's, yes, Jesus, feed us. We want the bread, God. Give us all those things. And then the next day, Jesus is back with his 12. He's back with the disciples. Who are you? Are you a part of the crowd or are you a part of the core? Are you devoted or are you simply showing up? Number two, somebody say number two. A disciple counts the cost. Somebody say, count the cost. This passage of scripture that we were in in Luke 14, Jesus continues the passage that we were just in. In verse 28, he says, but don't begin until you count the cost. For who of you would begin construction on a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money. And then everybody would laugh at you. They would say, there's a person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it, so you cannot be my disciple without giving up everything that you own. Again, he's not not saying that you literally need to go home and put your house on Zillow. He's not telling you that you literally got to grab your TV and your PlayStation and drag it to the corner and drop it off. He's not saying that you need to close down your business. You can't run a pizza shop. But what he's saying is, like, if those things are holding you back, are you with me? If those things are holding you back, if those things are standing between me and you, if that TV has become an idol to you, then please take it to the curb and dump it. Are you with me? If you are so obsessed with acquiring more possessions that you can't even be present in your relationship with me, then burn it. That's what he's saying. We know as Americans that freedom isn't free. Is that accurate? Like we know the freedom that we enjoy. There were men and women that gave their lives, that died for it. There are men and women that had to count the cost. Am I actually going to go and fight this battle so that future generations can have freedom? That was a decision that they made. Listen, freedom isn't free and following Jesus isn't easy. Our faith isn't free either. Have you counted the cost? Have you truly counted the cost? Me and my wife, when we came to plant this church, we had to count the cost. We, we lived in Florida. My kids were born there. We lived in the same house. I was just telling somebody before church, all of my kids were born in the same house. Me and Ashley got married 
and lived in the same house our whole marriage. We owned the house free and clear. No debt. Had so much security. All of Ashley's family lived there. All of my family lived there. Everything, everybody, everything was there. And then we had to make a decision. Are we going to leave all of that behind and move to Texas that we've never been to before? We didn't know anybody here. Zero people. I'm not joking. We knew zero people. Nobody. Do we want to do that? I remember the first time I came to Anchor Bend, the first time I came to this church, I sat in this chair right over here next to Pastor Jim because me and Ashley came to visit Sugarland. We were trying to decide if we wanted to plant a church here, and I had never been to a church in Texas in my life, and I wanted to see what it was like. I want to see if this is like Florida, and I sat over there, and I remember sitting in that chair looking around with Ashley well over a year ago in October of 2022. I was sitting in that chair. I was looking around thinking, do I want to come to Fort Bend County and start a church? Do I want to leave everything behind? And I remember sitting in that chair counting the cost of what it would mean to leave everything behind and come to this area, to this region, and start a church. Have you counted the cost? It'd be so much easier for me if I was not a pastor. Can I tell you guys right now? It'd be so much easier. But I'm a disciple of Jesus. I don't want to do anything else. I could go do a video. I could go do, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to. Why? Because Jesus has changed my life. And he's the most important thing on the planet to me. And I don't want to do anything else. I don't care. Take it all. I want to risk everything. My family, my future, all of it, my security. Why? Because I'm a disciple of Jesus. And that makes me do weird things. Like, leave one stain, go to another place. I don't know anybody. It's weird. It doesn't make sense. That's okay. Why? Because I'm a disciple, and I'm an apprentice of Jesus. And when Jesus tells me, I want you to preach the gospel and pastor people, I'm like, where do you want me to do that? I'll do it. I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Have you counted the cost in your life? The cost of serving on a team here. What That means i got to get there early. That means i got to set things up. i got to stand outside. There's a guy. Where's Trey? Is Trey in this room right now? Trey's not in the room. Trey was standing outside. It's 9,000 degrees. And he was standing by the street with a sign saying, you look amazing today. And I walked out to take a picture of him. He said, hey, Pastor Daniel, I just got flipped off for the first time doing this. <laughs> Big old smile on his face. I'm like, I'm glad you're durable, buddy. <laughs> like, where, where else? Like, like I, I signed up for this. I signed up to stand out in 11,000 degrees and hold a sign and have you flip me off as you drove by. I am made for this. Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost? Have you counted the cost of, like, of tithing or of giving? Wait a minute. Like, I got a lot of bills to pay. The Bible's super clear. Ask Christians that God gets our first fruits. No, 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 that applies to other people. That applies to all the rich people in church. There's a lot of rich people. I saw what you drove into church with. You're the person that gives, not me. You came in here in a BMW, and I came in here in a busted Honda. That's not for me. Count the cost. Count the cost. Number three, and then I'm going to close. Number three, a disciple is fruitful. Somebody say fruitful. John chapter 15, verses 8 says, when you produce much fruit, you prove that you are my true disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. When you produce much fruit, you prove it. Prove it. You guys ever, anybody ever watch Jerry Maguire? Show me the money. Show me the money. You prove that you are his disciples. Listen, when you produce much fruit. Show me the fruit. Show me the fruit. Show me the fruit. Jesus, I love you. Show me the fruit. Jesus, you're the most important thing. Show me the fruit. Jesus, nothing else matters but show me the fruit. When you produce much fruit, you prove that you are my true disciples. Listen, this brings great glory to my Father. Do you want to bring glory to our Heavenly Father? I do, so I want to be fruitful. I do, so I want to be fruitful. You know, a lot of times I get a, a lot of young people in church that come up to me like, Pastor, how do I know if I'm a Christian? How do, I, how, do, how do I know? Have you guys ever wondered that? How do I know? How do I know? 
A good way of determining the authenticity of your Christianity is your devotion to multiplication. That's a good way of determining the authenticity. Listen, if I am passionate about something, I multiply that thing. If I'm excited about something, I generate more. A distinguishing characteristic of a disciple is your fruitfulness. If you're a fan of a franchise, you're eager to create more fans, aren't you? Like if you're an Astros fan, you are not going to settle for somebody that's a Dodgers fan. Right? You're like, oh no, we're about to fix you. You guys see me do it all the time with in and out That's mostly because I love you. But I see so many Whataburger fans out there, and I'm like, that is not the Lord's way. A parent that is passionate about family values is preoccupied with producing dependents that are dedicated to perpetuating their, their shared character. If you're passionate about your kids, you want your kids to share your family values. You want to multiply yourself. The things that your parents taught you are things that you're instilling into your children. Those same values, those same principles, the things that you learn in church, you want to share that down with your kids. The question, the, the, the determining factor if, if we are true disciples or not is, are you reproducing? Are you being fruitful? I shared earlier, the average Christian goes to church once every six weeks. Is that fruitful or not fruitful? The average Christian statistically will never in their entire lives will never win one person to Jesus. The average Christian in their entire lives will never reach one person for Christ. But the Bible tells us that the average disciple will multiply 30, 60, or 100 times what was planted. It's fruitfulness. And listen, what we label things matters. And for all of us in here tonight, if you're a Christian, congratulations. You're in the family of faith. You've made it. You're here. We're so thankful that you're here. I'm so glad that I can call you a brother or sister in Christ. I'm not trying to say that it's insignificant. It's so significant. You could be an atheist. You could, you could be pursuing everything that the world throws your way, and I'm glad that you're here, but let me just tell you that you being here is the starting line, not the finish line. You being here is the starting line, not the finish line. And God's got so much more ahead of you than where you are today. And my prayer for you and my encouragement for you is to move forward and build momentum in your life. To say, I'm, I, I started here, that's great, but I want to be an apprentice. I want to count the cost. I want to be fruitful. I want to demonstrate my devotion to God. So my question for you tonight that I want you to wrestle with, if you're taking notes, write these questions down. I want you to ask yourself these questions later, and then we're going to close. Are you a disciple? Are you a disciple? Next question, are you being discipled? Who's developing you? Who, who has permission to speak into your life? Is it your pastor? Is it another mature brother or sister in the faith? How are you being discipled? And are you following Jesus? to a greater degree day after day. Are you a disciple or are you a Christian?